This is another Debate Talk for You radio public announcement. The views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers plus invited guests are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. Fringe check, fringe check, download today. Fringes is a new mobile app designed to meet, mix, and post with Tory keepers like you. That's right. How pleasant is it for brethren to dwell together in unity? Bring it out. Fringes is available on Google Play and the App Store. Ashe, beautiful people, this is Reese Roberts. I am the host of the Entertain the Thought podcast on SoundCloud, and I want to give a tremendous shout out to Sal and Debate Talk for You Radio for providing a space where like-minded people can really come together and discuss the true state of our community as melanated people. I really want to thank you, Sal, for providing this service to the community and also for providing us access to information. That's one thing that's truly uh, assisting us in our progression as a community of people and it's just invaluable the service that you provide with your shows and all of your productions thank you so much for being who you are peace love and light from reese roberts don't touch that dial you're now listening to the big talk Free radio Okay, well, first and foremost, I want to give all praise to the supreme intelligence of the universe, the God of our ancient forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to say respect to all of our listening audience out there, whether they be messianic or non-messianic. Uh, I just want to send love to the entire Hebrew community. Uh, and to anyone who may be listening outside of that paradigm, I'm also sending love and peace your way as well. And here's the first question, Zion. You ready? You in the hot seat, brother. You ready? <laughs> You're putting fire in the hot seat, so I'm good. Yeah, yeah man. All right, here's the first question. Uh, lately, we've been having a lot of uh, debates and discussions between messianics and non-messianics. Um, what is your take when it comes to the differences between the non-messianics and the messianics? I think All our right. differences are very simple, very cut and dry in that uh, a messianic will essentially be a person who accepts both the Torah as well as the New Covenant, or i.e. the New Testament. By default, they also accept a personality by the name of uh, Yeshua, or some say Yahweh Shai, as their um, Messiah. Me being a non Messianic in the sense that I don't believe in the person of Yeshua or Yeshahawashai. Um, I don't agree with that. I don't hold that to be true. I follow the Torah and the Torah alone, and and I do so proudly. Uh, I do so proudly because I know that even the individuals that are spoken of in the New Testament, these are individuals that only had a Torah. These are individuals that never saw the book of Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John. When we speak about Yeshua, we must remember that he never had a New Testament. Him and his followers only had an Old Testament, and he's on record teaching from it. So if the Old Testament was sufficient for him to carve an ideology of salvation, then for me, it's simple. Torah is all I need. Uh, I have great respect for Messianics. I have a lot of Messianic brothers and sisters, uh, and the most I ask is that my views be respected, and I will respect everyone else's views. But at the end of the day, we are all entitled to our views so long as we voice them with respect. Yeah, actually, here's a follow-up question of the same uh, person. Do you find the term non-Messianic offensive? Um, I don't find it offensive as much as I find it a misnomer. Because all of us believe that a Messiah is coming. We just disagree on who he may is, on who he may be. So all of Israel essentially are messianic. By definition, we all are waiting upon a Messiah. We just differ on who that Messiah is. So I don't find it as much as an insult as I find it to be a misnomer. 
All right, people, so we're going to go to the phone lines. Once again, if you have any questions or comments, they're pressing number one. Any question that you have, feel free to relay it tonight. You know, if I have, if I have a hold your peace, again, the number is 646-716-7320. Uh, when you call in, simply press number one, and we'll add you to the conversation. Uh, let's go to the phone lines. Let's see who's here. Let's go to nine one six seven four seven. You're live on the air. Nine one six seven four seven. Okay, the call call actually dropped. All right. All right. Let's go to the next person. Again, you know the number six four six seven one six seven three two zero. Simply press number one, and we'll add you in. Let's go to eight three two five five seven. You live in there. Eight three two five five seven. Can you hear me? Hello. Oh, we're down to technical difficulties tonight. Eight three two. Can you hear me? Hey, what's up? Hey, Zion. Can you hear me, Zion? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. All right, eight three two, eight three two. Hold on, let me see what's going on here. Hold on. Right, let's go to the next person. Let's go to four zero four nine three six. You're live on the air. Hey, how y'all doing? Peace and blessings. Uh, what up to you, John? Le- I mean, uh, Mr. Lex. Uh, shalom. Who am I speaking with? This is Pitt Boss in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, shalom to you, brother. Hey, uh, the question I have for you is uh, in the book of Daniel, as he uh, gave a prophecy in the arrival of the um, Messiah, and I wanted to get your take on uh, did that occur or did that event not occur that he spoke of when he spoke of the end of times, from either from, you know, like Daniel 12 or anywhere in the book he speaks it out. The coming of a Messiah, and what is your take on the Book of Daniel? So your question is, uh, what are my thoughts on Daniel's depiction of a Messiah? Yes, as the appearance of the Messiah. The appearance of the Messiah. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna. If, I, if you want a direct, um, I'm sorry. If you wanted a direct verse, it would be like. Uh, Daniel 12, and, uh, uh, yeah, starting at 1, is the is the, end, uh, the prophecy of the end time. Daniel 12. Um, let me try to read it real quick so I could just go there okay. with you in thought. Uh, it says, And at that time shall Mikael stand up, the great prince who shall charge over your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation Till that time, but at that time your people shall be saved, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. You want me to keep reading? Uh, I mean, you know, you probably would have to, you know, you don't have to read the whole reference to whatever you understand from from his prophecy because, uh, you know, if you go to verse 7, he speaks about the four beasts and that the Messiah would uh, appear during the reign of the fourth beast. If you, if in, you, da- you in, know Daniel's, in Daniel 7, it's, I mean, uh, 12, it speaks about a fourth beast? Well, no, it, Start off in in, in uh, chapter seven, and oh, in chapter seven there until yeah, in chapter seven it continues to chapter twelve. But the the prophecy is about the four beasts, and then during the reign of the fourth beast, the Messiah will appear. Okay, um, let me go to seven really quick with you, and just kind of okay. confirm what what it is that you're seeing. That way, we're all on the same page. Um, I'm very familiar with the uh, beast mentioned in Daniel number 7. As a matter of fact, Daniel is one of my favorite prophets. Uh, Years ago, I would always say to myself that uh, I would either name myself Daniel as a legal name or I would name my son Daniel. Uh, Neither one worked out, but nonetheless, I still have a great deal of love and respect and admiration for this particular prophet right here. 
so I'm very much immersed into it. So um, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be different from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth. And the ten horns. If you go you know, to the, like verse 13, I'm sorry. If you go to verse 10, I mean, you can read up until there, but in verse 13. Wait, Daniel 7 and 13? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Bear with me, too. I'm also reading from a Hebrew Bible, not an um, English version. So my 13 may be different from yours. My, first, my 13 starts off by saying, I saw in the night visions. Would that be the verse? Hello? Hey, yeah, is the four, caller still four, with us? Yeah, yeah, I see you on the line. Four, four, pip, pip boy, she's still there? Four, four? It's probably on mute or something like that. But go ahead. He's still on the line. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I'll read verse 13 the way I see it. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one shall not be destroyed. Okay, I'm here. Uh, I guess the brother's asking me my interpretation of the verse. Uh, We do see verse 13 as a reference to the Mashiach or the Messiah, um, I think it would be nonsensical to interpret it any other way. So clearly mm-hmm. this references the uh, Messiah. Um, but the real question is, um, what is the yardstick by which we're defining who the Messiah is in this particular verse? Because we will both look at this verse and agree that it is definitely speaking of the Messiah to come, but then the onus is on one of us to prove who this will be, and for me, I don't know who the Messiah is based on my research, um, and I've yet to meet How? any. I'm sorry. Okay, I and didn't I've mean met. To catch I, I've, I didn't no problem, brother. And I, I would add that I've yet to have dialogues with any messianic brother who has, um, you know, shown me uh, with enough evidence that this would be a reference to uh, Yahweh Shai or Yeshua. Okay, would you agree that as it goes through the fourth beast, it talks about the Babylonians as the first beast, the Persians and the Medes as the second beast, the Greeks yes, sir. as the third beast, yes, and sir. the Romans as the fourth beast? That's right. So, and the ten toes so and the ten barbarian tribes? I have a little different. Yeah, yeah, I'll go for that. Um, and, uh, and so though we may not identify the... Uh, the Messiah, we, we do know that the Roman Empire existed, and if the prophecy was to be true, then he had to appear during the Roman Empire. He said he had to appear based on the context of either either verse that we read in the Roman Empire, or are you drawing from another verse? Uh, it said, well, if you go through that verse, uh, as it, as it says, I watched to the thrones, and I'm just reading from a, a New King James Version, but it says, I watched to the thrones were put in place, and the ancient of days were seated. So then if you build up to that as you're breaking down each beast, it will talk about when it gets into the, the, the fourth beast with the seven heads and the ten horns, okay. that during this beast's reign, the, 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 um, the uh, Messiah would appear. So if you're describing the ten horns, as the ten barbaric tribes, and definitely he had to appear during that time. Even if we can't identify, you know, exactly who he was, you, you would have to either say that this this uh, interpretation is not pertaining to the time of the Romans, and maybe sometime in the future, if, if you're saying he should appear in the future, or either this verse is referring to the time of the Romans. Okay, so I'll say this Um, If we're to take it into um, context I would say this Um, The Messiah, we know, bar none When he returns 
um, the redemption of the children of Israel is all, all automatically witnessed. Automatically witnessed. The children of Israel are said to be redeemed upon his return and saved from the land of their captivity. Um, the temple would be rebuilt and nations would not know war anymore, uh, nor would they have any use for instruments of war. So, of course, the prophet Isaiah says that nations would beat their swords into plowshares. So what I'm saying or what I'm suggesting is this. Although um, clearly you would definitely have a point in literally going line for line in these couple of verses that we just read and then drawing the conclusion that since the fourth beast uh, is so close to the Messiah's appearance, wouldn't it be plausible or accurate to say that he already appeared? I would then ask you about the prophecies that speak about the Messiah specifically, which states that when he returns, that um, Israel will be redeemed, we would return to our land, um, the temple would be rebuilt, and we would have no use for our instruments of war. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, immediately following the, um, the, the Roman occupation of Israel, immediately following that era, uh, we went into exile once again, so we weren't redeemed. Uh, our temple wasn't rebuilt. It was destroyed. Uh, nations didn't beat their swords into plowshares. In fact, they developed nuclear weapons. So when I look at all of those things, for me, that is a clear and concise um, sign, if you will, that um, the Messiah has not made his appearance because I have yet to see in the um, Old Testament prophecies, which is where we must look for a Messiah, I've yet to see in the Old Testament prophecies the concept of a second coming. Um, if the Messiah appeared or was supposed to appear in the time period of Rome, I would have no problem with that. I don't have any personal problems with Yeshua, mind you. Um, there's a lot of misinterpretation when it comes to my views on him. People think that I have something against him. I have nothing against him, per se, or his teachings, per se. My sole basis of the rejection of the idea is that I, I just simply do not believe that he fits into the prophecy. Of course, when you say that, you have people that are already emotionally invested in the idea that he is a Messiah, so people become offended. But um, I usually try to adjure people not to be offended simply because I don't see something the way that you see it, um, and I, that, which is why I can definitely appreciate, you know, even the way that you're, you're dialoguing with me because I'm pretty sure you feel strongly about him being the Messiah and about him having come already and maybe encountering my view, which is different, may be a little tough. Nonetheless, you're sharp enough and strong enough to at least hear me out, you know. So um, to me, that's a, that's a step in a positive direction because when you have two humble brothers talking about a, partic a, a particular matter like this, so long as we're humble, we can come to an honest conclusion so I, I definitely appreciate your spirit. Oh, for sure, for sure. I mean, you know, it's always good to uh, see you speak um, or teach, you know, the word. I mean, you, you definitely come in a humble spirit. I mean, uh, for me, you know, I don't have no problem at the position that you take. I mean, I definitely, I believe in the Old and New Testament or the Torah and the Tanakh and the Gospels. And uh, if I, you know, what we say is that the uh, Torah and the Tak Tanakh is the New Testament concealed, and that the New Testament is the Torah and the Tak Tanakh revealed. So everything that you read in the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, as they would not know uh, the end time, as uh, the angel told um, Daniel to seal up the book of the prophecy for the time was not yet at hand. And then in the New Testament, with the teachings of the Messiah, the time was at hand, and to Paul and his other apostles, the end was revealed. Okay. Um, being that I, I consider myself um, a, a, a studious 
personality. Um, I study both texts uh, vividly, um, meticulously, if you will. And one thing I, I came across replete throughout the uh, New Testament uh, canon is the idea that uh, Yeshua certainly believed that he was living in the last days. He said it. It actually came out of his mouth. He believed that he was living in the end times. There are a number of his followers who also believed that they were also living in the last days and that salvation of Israel was imminent. Um, the problem that I have with that is that we didn't receive salvation, unless maybe my definition of salvation may be different from the way that my brothers see it. I believe that my brothers see that the life laid down by Yeshua ushered in salvation or a time period where we could go on and continue until another time. Um, whereas myself and non-Messianics, we see salvation as imminent redemption, as God himself, if you will, re being revealed uh, through the spirit of his people, through the spirit of his prophets, as the text says that our prophets shall once again dream dreams, as well as through, obviously, the spirit of the Messiah. We see salvation as being an imminent thing, not something that we would have to wait for. So when we see the Messiah, we look for the salvation or the redemption. Uh, one thing that the children of Israel uh, understood with regard to Moses in Egypt was that his very appearance and the confirmation that he spoke with God, there were certainly those among him that knew that salvation was near, and they were right. So with that being said, um, I simply just don't see the New Testament as a fulfillment, if you will, of the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah to come. Um, I also don't see the New Testament as the um, expressed will of God, for lack of a better term. Uh, for instance, uh, I had a debate about a year ago or a summer ago, which caused a rift in the community. I'm pretty sure you may have heard about it. Myself, um, Hashar, uh, Priest Daniela, and Divine Prospect, we were all engaged in a debate. And um, this debate caused a rift in the community simply because we have different views. Um, and what I learned in that debate, or confirmed, let me say, what I confirmed in that debate is something that still perplexes me, which is uh, during that dialogue, I had asked the brother several times if the virgin birth is something they accept. They all laughed at me, not realizing that I know they don't accept the virgin birth. I'm a very intelligent young man. I understand completely that they don't understand the virgin birth, but there was a design in me asking them that question of which I don't believe they still acknowledge to this day. The point of me asking them that question is this. I'll first give you their answer. They said they reject the virgin birth. I said, okay. So if you reject the virgin birth, yet it's recorded in your text, would you now be on record telling me that your text has a lie in it to which the brothers agreed? And I stopped tape immediately so that confirmation in the room could be heard, so that people could understand that they were agreeing with what we Old Testament Israelites say, that the New Testament has lies or at least a lie. So once I got them to agree that the virgin birth is a lie, yet it's in their text, now I rightfully stepped in my position to question the integrity of the book itself because the New Testament says emphatically that God is not the author of confusion. So if God is not the author of confusion, yet a lie made its way to the book, then how is God the author of that book? Once again, 
This is the Hot Seat segment of Debate Talk for you. My special guest is Zion Lex. And again, we're taking uh, the people's questions and comments on social media. All you got to do is press number one, and we'll add you to the conversation. The number is 646-716-7320. Simply press the number one, and we'll add you in the conversation. Let's go to the next person. Let's go to 404-788. You're live on the air. Hey, Shalom. It's Award of Swords. How you doing? Uh, hey, Shalom, up, brother. How you doing? All right, brother. Hey, listen, man. Uh, yeah, I watch a lot of your videos, man. You're a wise, brother. I like your spirit and stuff. But uh, like just now, you made a statement about the virgin birth, and you said that that's, that's in the Bible. What, what, what part at? I'm just curious. What, what part you was talking about that is in the New Testament about the virgin birth? Okay, so the book of Matthew, chapter 1, mentions a virgin birth when it comes to the personality of uh, Yeshua or some even say, I guess, Jesus Christ. Um, the fact that it's recorded in Matthew, chapter 1, verse uh, 18, leaves me perplexed with my Messianic brothers because my Messianic brothers tell me that the virgin birth is a pagan concept something that I, I actually agree with them on. So at least, you know, we have that in agreement. We both agree that a virgin birth is a pagan concept. So my next question to my good brothers was, um, if the virgin birth is a pagan concept, yet it's in your book, and you're also telling me that the fact that it made your book is because someone put it there and it doesn't belong there, then now I have a question. And I believe my question was very fair and also very simple. If your book includes a pagan concept, which was not authored by God, how can I or you go on record calling this a book authored by God if a lie and a pagan thought made its way into it? Then I yeah. followed up. Then I okay. followed up with a very fair assessment which I asked them, does the Old Testament have any lies in it? The brother said no. And I said, I rest my case. Yeah, can, can I say something on that? Absolutely. Well, yeah, well, you know, I had the base on the virgin birth, and I, I don't believe, you know, like even the verse you just quoted, it doesn't say that. Nothing about a virgin birth. And when you read the 16th verse, verse, it clearly, it clearly tells you that Joseph is his father. He's in that bloodline. So a lot of people see what they want to see. You, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So I think if, if me and you break bread on it, you'll see that, that, that you know, that's, that's not true. Okay, so let me, let me just follow you for a second. I'm going to walk with you uh, figuratively and uh, crack open the book real quick so that um, we can just look at this one more time and confirm what we both can see. Um, so I'm going to read it aloud. Um, okay, so I'm in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Okay. It says, Now the birth of Yeshua was on this wise, mm -hmm. when as his mother Miriam was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Go say, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And I'll stop right there. Um, and I won't even ask a question, but I'll make a brief statement by giving a synopsis. So we just read verses 18 through 19, where it's telling you about the birth of Jesus, how he came. And the text explicitly says that before Mary and Joseph had sexual contact, she was with child. Joseph, knowing that he never had sexual contact with her, wanted to divorce her. Because as we know, in Torah, if he's engaged to her and she's having a child, and he know he never had sex with her, by Torah law, that would be adultery. But apparently he loved her so much that he didn't even want to make it an open issue. So the book says that, you know, he thought to put her away privately, meaning he thought to divorce himself from her privately or to end 
the engagement privately. So my point is very, very simple once again. The text is clearly letting you know that according to at least Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, Sin is not the father of Jesus because it says that he never had sex with her at this time, yet Jesus okay. was born. Okay, can, can I come in? Okay, can, did, you read the 16, did you read the 16 verse for me? Okay, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom was no, born no. Jesus, who was called Christ. Okay, what's your take on that verse? What's my take on this verse? This verse yeah. clearly is telling you that Joseph would be considered the son, excuse me, the father of Christ. But that doesn't make him the, um, how would you say, the, um, I'm trying to find the term to be very, very accurate and very, very fair. Um, that would not, okay, that would not make him the biological father. Um, right. Just because the text says, uh, because two verses later it tells you that he never had sex with Mary. So if he never had sex with Mary, and you and I both know that a way that a man has a child is that he has sex with a woman, then it doesn't matter what verse 16 is telling us. Verse 18 is telling us he never had sex with her. Let, let me say this right quick. See that okay. word right there that you, you, you ran over in verse 18? E-S-P-O-U-S-E-D. What that word mean? To engage. Huh? No. To engage. Well, when, you, when you go research it, in the history of Israel, they used to have a term called betrothed. Right, where you can be married to a woman and never okay. sexually dealt with. Huh? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the verse, the, the word right now. I actually have an Aramaic slash Hebrew version of the New Testament. This is the book that I used when I had my debate with Divine Prospect. I have it in my hand right now. The word that is used for engagement here is orasha, which means to be engaged. That is the Hebrew word that is used. So it says that they were engaged. In Hebrew tradition, when two people are engaged, you're not having sex because the minute you have sex, you're no longer engaged. So the fact that they're still engaged should also let you know that there wasn't any sexual contact or else she would already have been described as his wife. Right. Can I, can this I, verse there, it simply says that Mary was a spouse to him. We all know right. that verse 16 calls him her husband and also calls him um and it, it says, of whom Jesus was born, which is, if you really look at it, it's kind of worded strangely because it doesn't even call him his father. It just says, of whom he was born. Um, Any time in the Old Testament where you have a child and the father is named, it always says father, and that was his father, and the son of so-and-so, and this is his father. Nowhere here does it call him father. It just says, of whom was born Jesus. So what we know based on, um, I would call, uh, Israelite tradition is that any man who uh, assumes the father role of a child is considered that child's father. That doesn't make that man the child's biological father. Because if that man was the child's biological father, then the writers would have no need to beat around the bush. They would have called him simply the father of Christ. But the text specifically says of whom was born Yeshua. So what the text does is it straddles, for lack of a better term, around the idea of him actually being the biological father. But in verse 18, it clears it up because verse 18 tells you he's actually not the biological father because he never had sex with her during the time that she got pregnant. Can, can I say this? Let me say this for time's sake that quick. Now, I'm, I'm going to use that word. I'm going to show that word in the scripture, right, where it's being used in its right context, okay, because we know that marriage is a replica of the father's marriage to Israel. So it's going to be that same word is going to be used. Look how it's used in this, this scripture. This is our Second Corinthians, right, 11 verse 2. It says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused, that's the same word that's used in that verse, right? It's going to give us the understanding of what espoused mean according to Scripture. It says, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So that word being espoused means you're a chaste virgin. So when it said espoused in that text that you read, she was a virgin, 
okay, at that point. She was she didn't have physical sex with Joseph at that point. That's what the word expouse means. That's why I said you breathed over that word. Everybody that teach that virgin birth doctrine, they breathe over that word, and they don't really understand what that word means because the indoctrination of that said fuck in the sea what they don't see. Okay, That's why I told so, you to read. You see Joseph in the bloodline. Joseph is in Jesus' bloodline, his okay, generation. So this, this is what I want to say, and I think yeah. that um, this this would just be very, very clear and also extremely fair. So um, to be very fair with you, let's say this. I'm going to concede to some of your argument just for a moment so that we can really think about something. So okay. in conceding to your argument, which uh, essentially means for a moment's sake, I'll give you the benefit of doubt, and let's say uh, perhaps you're right. Let's say you're right that I'm looking at the word espousal wrong, right? Let's look at this. Verse 18 simply says, when Mary was espoused to Joseph, which you say is marriage, and I'll, I'll accept that, before they came together, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. That's mm-hmm. your answer right there. Before they came together, she was found with child. There's no way he could be the father if before they came together, she was found with child. It doesn't get more simple than that. Now listening to the Big Talk Radio, this is the Hot Seat segment. The number is 646-716-7220. And uh, we're on a timer, people. We're on a timer. Right about now, uh, 34 minutes has passed. We're only going to do 60 minutes for this particular show, the Hot Seat. Again, if you have any questions or comments, you know that number, 646-716-7220. Simply uh, press number one, and we'll add one to the conversation. If you're listening on social media or if you're listening on blog, so just dial the number and press number one, and we'll add you in the conversation. My special guest is Zion Lex. We actually have a question in the chat room, Zion Lex. Let me um, read this question real quick. And uh, shout out to the people that's in the chat room. We appreciate you being here live. It says, uh, in the Matriot of the Covenant lecture and book, you broke down the Torah science of Harriet Tubman. What is your perspective on her being on a $20 bill? <laughs> it's a slap in the face to our people because I'm pretty sure if she's alive, uh, she wouldn't be honored by simply being projected or um, objectified on the currency of a people who have yet to have given her people their due, um, social, socio-politically, uh, monetarily, and spiritually. We have not received our just due in this country. So I believe emphatically that Harriet Tubman would consider this a slap in the face which is why, if you notice, most of our people, they have their eyes open very wide. And what they have done on social media is completely made a mockery of it, as it should be. It should be mocked, because I emphatically believe that Harriet Tubman would have viewed this as a slap in the face to simply put her on fiat currency as if that would make up for anything that we uh, lost and or are due. It's a slap in her face. I don't want to see our mother honored in such a way. You know how you honor a woman who fought for our freedom? Give us our just due. Most definitely. Let's go to the next caller. Again, and if you press number one, just stand by. I'm going to get to you guys. Stand by. 917-499. You're live in air. Hello? Now, hey, how you doing? Welcome to the show. Hi, how you doing? I was just listening to the show. Um, in regard to the New Testament. And by the way, my name is Yadami Yahweh ben Yisrael. Oh, hey, Shalom. Shalom, Ah. Uh, shalom, how, how you doing? Okay, okay. Um, I Well, I want to congratulate, congratulate Zion Lex. I think um, there were so many questions that was raised, and uh, as um, as a scholar, and we have to look at linguistic artifacts. And when we look at Matthew chapter 18, it was speaking in past tense. Uh-huh. So when we look at linguistic artifacts and 
when, especially when we're speaking in the English tongue, which is a dramatic tongue derived from the sons of Gomer, right. not written in Iber or Ivrit, it's just the modern English. So, like Zion has cleverly put it, that I heard the other brother trying to make it seem like Joseph is the father of Jesus. When we actually read the whole story in a sense of astral theology, we know that this whole book called the New Testament and Jesus and Mary and Joseph is of the Essene Jews. They were never an Israelites, and they will never be. In the sense of looking at the birth and everything like that, it's all about astral theology. Since we were very, let's say, very wise in terms of looking at the constellation with the 12 months, 12 zodiac. And when we look at the occult science of everything, astrology is the number one when it comes down to learning the creator's way. So without being said, I think Zion Lex was not in a hot seat, but was very diplomatic in terms of answering questions. Great point. I myself is a Torah Hebrew, not bound to one book, a man of study. I don't play bias in terms of who's right or who's wrong. We all here for a common purpose is to learn and grow and strengthen one another. So we need to look at the New Testament as an actual theology sense. There is no savior for Israel but the Most High, Yohawa, Hashem Elohim. The Mashiach is within in us. Elijah is within in us. We are the son of God. So that's my intake. Thank you for having me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. You're very welcome. I received that very well. And I, I just want to add this to this particular discussion really quick. Um, the virgin birth is something that will always be a, a topic of debate among messianic and non-messianic because um, it is found in the foundation of the New Testament story. It's found in the very first chapter. And it's one of the key and determining factors for why most Torah-based Israelites will reject the New Testament on a whole. We know that let's go through the foundation for a second. And by foundation this time, I'm actually talking about Torah. Abraham and Sarah conceived and had a child, Isaac. Before they had this child, Isaac, Sarah was extremely old. So was Abraham. The Torah says explicitly that she had surpassed the age of women to even have children. So it was a miracle for her to even have a child. Yet, God blessed both her and Abraham, so that the fruit of her womb would open to receive Abraham's seed. In essence, what God did was he created a miracle through them and caused our forefather Isaac, from whom came Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So what I'm saying is this. Was there something wrong with Joseph? Why he could not have been the actual biological father? Because the way that we read the text, you must admit to be fear. You must admit the text is telling you that he is not the father. Because the text is telling you that she is found with child before they were together. Now we can say, let's go back and read verse 16. Let's go back and let's read in the book of Luke. Or let's go and check a manuscript. We can do that all day until we literally burn one another out. But it will never change the fact that verse 18 records 
or excuse me, verse 19 records that before they were together, she was found with child. That is explicitly telling you this man is not the father. So if this man is not the father, we now have a virgin birth. There's no way to escape it. So our more, I would say, honest messianic brothers who agree that this is talking about a virgin birth, they will just say, okay, it's a lie that made its way to the book. The Roman Catholic Church put it there to throw us off, which I, I would accept that more than a person telling me that what I'm reading is incorrect based on how I'm reading it because then that's insulting my intelligence. I know we both can read that this text is saying that before she was with Joseph that she had a child. So please don't insult my intelligence. So I, I respect my Messianic brothers more who will rather tell me that it's a lie and it made its way to the book. But even to those brothers, we have to come back to the question. If it's a lie that made its way to the book, how do you still claim that God authored this book? God is not the author of confusion as per your own book. Uh, we only have like a few more minutes left, people. Again, this is uh, going to only be a, a one-hour segment of the Bay Talk Radio, but we're going to get, get to as much people with questions as possible. Again, you know that number, 646-716-7320. Simply press number one, and we'll add to the conversation. I have another question in the chat room. This is from Jesse Benton. Uh, welcome to the show. It says, Shalom, this is Jesse, a.k.a. Yashaya from uh, South Korea. What's going on? How you doing? I'd like to know, why can't we find any tombs of the patriarchs? Any, okay. Oh, tombs? Yeah, well, tombs, let, me, let, right. me, let, me, let me say this. Uh, we know where all the tombs are. <laughs> you know, um, locating the tombs of the patriarchs is not the issue. It's gaining access to them that is the issue. Um, and this has always been a problem. You're not allowed anywhere near the sepulchre of our ancient forefathers. This is not a new law. This has been law in Israel since day one. We should know already as studious Israelites that you can't go near the sepulcher of one of the patriarchs or matriarchs. That's a no-no in Israel. You could never have done that. Um, so we know where their tombs are, but their tombs are not subject to uh, exhumation. Um, I believe Brother Divine Prospect said it best when he had a lecture at Son of the TV one day. And he said that when you go into African tradition and culture, of which Israel is a part of because Israel is situated in Northeast Africa, which sits on the Northeast African plate, tectonic plate. When you go into African tradition, and I'm quoting our brother Divine Prospect, you'll see that our ancestors never believed in disturbing. It was a great form of disrespect to approach the, a deceased sepulcher and do anything near it, especially to go as far as to dig it up. You see, Torah is such that we have such perfect faith in our God, who is our king, that we don't need to dig up the body of Abraham to confirm that he lived. Remember, the one thing that made God trust Abraham the most, and I believe even the New Testament itself takes special time to enumerate that is the very faith that Abraham had in the Almighty. Abraham had so much faith in God that he was willing to divorce himself from logic, and I'll give you an example in under 60 seconds. Abraham stood at the foot of the mountain to separate his son Isaac from life. Before he did so, God said, no, touch not the lad, for now I know you fear God. Here's my point in the form of a question and a statement. And this speaks to Abraham's faith. Abraham at that time already knew God does not require or desire human sacrifice. The entire time as Abraham is approaching Mount Moriah to offer up his son as a burnt offering, he knows this is not what God calls for. So you have to imagine that in his mind, he is battling with the idea of, am I to carry this out? 
a thing which I know God is against, or am I to still do it because God said it? Those of us, again, who are studious in Torah, we understand correctly that the tenth and final test that Abraham was given was that test, and that was the greatest test of all, because this test required Abraham to follow God where his logic would not go. I'm going to say that again for those who I know I missed. This tenth and final test was the greatest test of all, and it was an emblem of Abraham's faith, because this test required that Abraham follow God where his own logic was unwilling to go, meaning that Abraham knows God does not require human sacrifice. But simply because God commanded him to do it, Abraham suspended his logic and followed out the command of God simply because it came from God. This is the lesson that God wanted to implant in Abraham as well as us, the children of Israel. Even when you think that you have a better way, even when you think that you understand my way, you are still supposed to do according to that which is written in my word simply because it's written in my word or spoken out of my mouth. Divorce yourself from your own logic and do as I say. That is the lesson inherent on Mount Moriah. And Abraham passed it with flying colors. But God never caused that son to be sacrificed. He never caused that son to be killed because the other lesson is God does not condone human sacrifice. People, once again, we got Zion Lex right here on the Bay Talk Radio. We only have a few minutes left on the air, people. So if you have any questions or comments, you got to dial that number and press number one, and we'll add you in the conversation. Again, the show is archived, so if you want to go check it out later on, you have to go to the website, www.blogtalkradio.com, forward slash the Bay Talk for you, or uh, check it out on the YouTube channel. And, uh, of course, we appreciate the YouTubers out there that's been subscribing. Uh, let's go to the next person. Let's go to 404-936. You'll have an air. Hey, this, this is Pit Boss again, and uh, I just wanted to say a quick thing about that Matthew 1 and 16. When you read it, it says, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of Mary, identifying him as simply the husband of Mary. The following verse confirms that Jesus is of Mary, or it says, of whom was born Jesus, implying that the verse is speaking of Mary. So, uh, Zion Lex was correct as he uh, went further into verse 18 to uh, justify that before they came together, uh, uh, you know, she was with child. This is a fundamental to being a Christian. It's fundamental that you believe in the virgin birth. For those Hebrew Israelites who teach any otherwise, then Jesus himself or the Messiah would consider them vipers and blasphemers they don't believe in that as the Pharisees and the Sadducees was. That's a great point. I absolutely agree with the brother. The virgin birth is a cornerstone, if you will, of uh, the story. Uh, to separate it, you do great harm to the story. It is foundational. Um, it, is, it is in part based on the prophet Isaiah, according to the New Testament. Because if we continue to read, it connects this virgin birth to that which was spoken by Isaiah. If we come down to verse 23, which I was saving, I was hoping someone would say something that would bring it out, and this good brother actually did. So now verse 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be the child. I'll start with verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through his prophets, saying, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted, God is with us. So, from verse 16 to verse 21, the prophet is now telling you that all of these actions came to pass because of that which was spoken in Isaiah. So, it uses Isaiah as the template for all the actions that took place. In these last couple of verses Here is the problem Isaiah 7.14 Does 
does two or three things quite differently than most people imagine. For starters, the prophecy that Isaiah 7, 14 speaks is in the present tense, and it takes someone who has baseline understanding of the biblical Hebrew text to even understand that. Isaiah is speaking in the present tense. There is no indicator in that verse at all via the grammatic syntax that Isaiah is speaking in the future tense. He's speaking in the present tense as he says, Behold, a young woman is with child. He didn't say shall bear a son. That's future tense. The Hebrew reads is with child. So automatically, that makes the child contemporary with Isaiah, which makes sense. This is the point that everyone forgets. This child is supposed to be assigned to who? King Ahaz. Everyone forgets what the 14th verse is about. From verses 1 through 4 to 13, the prophet is addressing King Ahaz and his weak faith in the Almighty, so much so that he needed a sign. So God says to him, okay, I will give you a sign. He's speaking to Ahaz, I'm giving you a sign. And he says, behold, a young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey shall he eat until he knows to refuse the good and choose the evil, Yet before he reaches that age, the two kings whom you dread shall be done away with. Everybody forgets that. So when you read the entire verse in its context, meaning you actually read everything in the chapter, it's trying to tell you that the child, number one, is assigned to Ahaz. So Ahaz has to witness the child, the birth of the child. The child cannot be assigned to Ahaz if the child is not born yet. So that's something for people to consider. Secondly, the perverse always also says in Isaiah 7, 14, 15, 16, and 17 that the two kings that Ahaz fears shall be destroyed. This was fulfilled. The king of Assyria, Syria, and the king of Israel were both destroyed before the child reached age five, or, or at least during the time of Ahaz. That's what the text says. The two kings whom you fear will be destroyed that automatically places Emmanuel as a contemporary of Isaiah. So this destroys this entire chapter in the New Testament as being a valid, God-inspired text. Because if this chapter was inspired by God, it would not be speaking about Yeshua being a fulfillment of Emmanuel when when you go back to Isaiah 7.14, Emmanuel is a contemporary of Ahaz and Isaiah simply because the text says, the land and the two kings that you fear shall be destroyed before the child reaches the age of maturity. Clearly, if Jesus is a child or Yeshua is a child or Yahweh is a child, clearly the two kings would have been long and gone, so that's not what he's talking about. It, that's a no-brainer. You don't need a prophet to come and tell you that. At that time, nobody was living three or four hundred years. So that's a no-brainer. The prophet didn't come to tell them that the two kings that Ahaz is scared of are going to be dead by the time Yeshua is born. Think about it, my brothers. That would make absolutely no sense. <laughs> All right, we're going to only have time for maybe one or two more questions. And after that, we're going to pretty much wrap it up. I see the time is winding down. So let's go to the next person. Let's go to 414-550. You're live in the air. Uh, Shalom, Vlad Tov. I just wanted to uh, kind of piggyback on what uh, the previous brother said in terms of the grammar. Um, I think that is definitely the most objective way to approach uh, any problem arising from a textual exegesis. One, first and foremost, everyone has to remember you cannot perform any textual exegesis from literature and translation. So when he implored everyone to address the issue uh, from the standpoint of the Hebrew grammar, spot on. Uh, 14 reads, just like he said, So when he talked about the verb hara, that is a third feminine singular perfect. So that says that she has Conceived, well, he yelled it, and she has born, you know, a son, you know. 
okay? And she shall name or call his name Shamul Imunul So clearly, um, as we talked about, the, the timetable uh, is not favoring something that is going to happen because the verb would uh, first have a prefix or uh, either a woe conversive or a power prefix to indicate that she shall. And nothing about this morphologically is saying that she shall. This is definitely a simple active um, third feminine singular verb. So great job. So am I. Thank you very, very much. I totally agree with the brother. Thank you very much for to uh, enter and uh, bless us because, again, um, this is the issue. The issue that we're having is that most people who are reading this are not reading it in the original language it was spoken with. And for me, this always poses a problem. There's so many Israelites out there who really don't believe that it's worth it or valuable to learn our language and begin to study the text in the language it was spoken in. For those Israelites who believe that, I want to tell you right now, you're going to continue to put yourself in an intellectual corner that you can't come out of because you're limiting yourself. Why wouldn't you want to learn the language that the universe has spoken into existence using? Why wouldn't you use the language that is described as the Fat Hayamet, the language of truth? Why wouldn't you want to use the language that our forefathers spoke? Why wouldn't you want to learn and reclaim your legacy is what I'm trying to get at. And this is at the heart of the problem. Most of the contextual errors that is made on behalf of my New Testament or Messianic brothers comes from a lack of understanding of Hebrew. For instance, I criticize Daniela for his pronunciation, his incorrect pronunciation of the term or name Yeshua as it is pronounced in the Aramaic. He wants to tell me that it's Yahawashai when he also told me he doesn't speak Hebrew. He doesn't speak Hebrew, but he wanted to correct me on the pronunciation. That right there is a problem. My community can vouch for me and let you know that I've been studying Hebrew for 20-plus years, and I've been a teacher of it for 10-plus years, 10 of those years. So I automatically find a problem with someone who doesn't know a language at all and then tries to correct someone who's a teacher of it. In my opinion, that's pride and that's arrogance. Whereas I was styled as the arrogant one in that discussion, no. I should have correctly been acknowledged as the authoritative one in that discussion because I was the only one who actually had real training in the language as was demonstrated. Even Divine Prospect wound up abandoning his brothers on that topic because he told them emphatically, well, I believe it more to be like Yahusha. He left them out there with the whole Yahawashai thing because Divine Prospect knows enough to know Yahawashai is way off. That's it, people. That's that is it. <laughs> you know the hot tea segment is over. I appreciate my brother Zion Lex for coming on. And we, uh, no, we have another hot tea actually next week with uh, Rob Rack. And uh, by the way, next week we have four shows. We have a show Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday next week right here on the Pitopi Radio. Um, Zion Lex, any last words you want to share with the people? Go ahead. Absolutely. I want to say thank you for having me on the show. I also want to say thank you to my New Testament and or Messianic brothers that were listening, thank you for having patience. Trust me and believe me that I generally get it and I understand that it's very hard to allow room for a person to speak against something that we are intellectually attached to, spiritually attached to, as well as being emotionally attached to. So I thank you for allowing me to express my opposite opinion in a respectful way. And I hope that we can continue this dialogue in a respectful way. And the door, in my opinion, should always be open for us as brothers to have these dialogues so long as we maintain a level of respect. None of us are perfect, so there may be flaws in the process, but I think that if we can acknowledge that we're brothers, that we should be able to begin and end in peace. So uh, my brother Sal, thank you very much for allowing me in the show. I wish it was two hours because I'm really dedicated to this. I love this. You know, I would stand toe-to-toe with any messianic 
on any given day on any issue in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, the very first time I spoke with my brother Sal, I was telling him, and he may remember this, that I wanted to battle with Brother Josh. And I remember that Brother Josh was laughing. He was like, man, well, you know, nobody really know you, and I don't really know what you're capable of. Well, fast forward a year later, and I'm not sure if Josh want to have this conversation with me. Have a great night. Oh, oh, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he does. <laughs> and we can definitely uh, talk behind the scenes and uh, set that up. But any website information you want to put out there, like, uh, you know, websites? Um, or yes, yes. Um, I would like to put out um, my books are available on Amazon.com as well as Barnes & Noble's online bookstore. You can simply type in the name you know best, Zion Lex, with two X's, and you'll find me on Amazon online as well as Barnes & Noble's online. Um, thank you very much uh, to everyone who has supported me and has continued to support me. And I also want to say thank you to those who don't support me because in your non-support, it causes me to dig deeper in order to reach you. So I thank you for making me work harder, and I appreciate you.